So hi everyone, I'm Heather and I'm going to be talking about what I did this summer with my research um, and introduce you to this really awesome emerging field called sonification. So I'm going to read a definition to you and it's going to be a little wonky but bear with me. So sonification is the translation of data relationships into sounds that exploit the auditory perceptual abilities of human beings such that the data relationships are comprehensible which is a textbook definition, but it actually just means that sonification turns data into sound. And you can hear the patterns in the data instead of having to look at a graph and try to see them. So the methods that you use in sonification utilize psychoacoustics, which is something I didn't know was a thing, but I think it's really cool. Um, it's the scientific study of how humans perceive sound. So I'm gonna go into sonification a little bit here. So in order to sonify stuff, um, you use coding software to manipulate the auditory dimensions of pitch, which is like the note that you hear, the timbre, which is like the quality of the sound, how a piano sounds different from a saxophone, uh, the loudness or the volume or amplitude, and spacing, which can be rhythm, it can be tempo, anything like that. So when you sonify something, you map the dimensions of data to the dimensions of music. Uh, and I'll make sure that makes a lot more sense later, but you explore and best represent the context and trends of the data. And there are multiple different types of sonification, but there's a little chart here, um, which was made by DeCampo. He has been doing a lot of research into sonification over the last 10 years. And you can see here, it's okay. Um, I don't fully understand it. I'll be honest with you. Um, but there's discrete point where each piece of data is a specific note, like a little plunk. Continuous, which is what you hear like a siren. And then model based, which is you put, you make an algorithm that best represents the data as a whole. And it's a lot more flexible and confusing. Um, so this little graph tells you how to choose which sonification method. So the X axis is the number of data points. It says needed for gestalt perception. I'm not going to go into that right now because I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that means. But in general, number of data points and the number of data points needed for gestalt perception are pretty similar when you're working with data sets that are less than like a million. And then the, um, the y-axis is the number of properties of data, which can be like, if you're making a table, how many lines you have or something like that, or it can be something really confusing with model-based, but we're gonna focus on some examples. So you actually know sonification. The Geiger counter is technically sonification. It's discrete point, which means that each little data point is a specific sound. And the spacing of the text are mapped to the number of ionization events. So it's one parameter of sound spacing mapped to one parameter of data ionization events. Another example, I don't, I couldn't find the audio because uh, it was taken off the internet, but it's really cool, I promise. And a, uh, a scientist took EKG readings and turned them into songs. So you could hear the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy heart. And these were continuous, like you see the lines on, um, a heart monitor. And then an example of mod uh, model based is that NASA has this really fun group that's turning images from space into music. And I have an example of it right here. Um, I don't know much about space, so bear with me. But the way that this is mapped is that dark matter is the lowest frequency and actually is the highest frequency. And then you'll hear uh, the notes at the top of the picture are a higher pitch than the notes at the bottom of the picture. Just play a few seconds of it really quick. Which sounds really cool, but it doesn't make that image any easier to understand. It's just really pretty. Um, so that's model based sonification, which is not what I worked on this summer. I just thought I would show you that really fun example. Really intimidating when I first got into the field, I'll be honest with you. And... Okay, so some purposes of sonification. Um, hi. In general, you can just reconfigure data to reveal new trends. It's the same thing you do where you'll turn one data set into like eight different types of graphs and see if any of them show a trend that you didn't see with the first one. Another part of sonification that I think is really important in the classroom is engaging a sense that isn't often utilized in learning, which is your ears. Your ears can hear little tiny variations in data that your eyes might not be able to see. You'd be so shocked at like the difference in like a fraction of a decibel that, or like a fraction of a hertz 
that your ear can pick up. Um, so I feel like it's this entire part of our brain that we're not even really utilizing. Uh, it's been used a lot in artistic expression. So Andrea Poli is this amazing political artist and she's just been turning data into art in general. So it can be like visual art or my favorite is her Sonic Antarctica where she made this entire track you can get on iTunes. Um, and she turned everything from like CO2 levels and ice cores to the sound of their helicopter when they were flying over Antarctica to like the crunching of boots in the snow, all the different sounds of Antarctica from data to the actual experience and turn them into these really immersive pieces. So it's like part sonification um, and part just like really cool. Um, another thing that you can do that I would like to take my research in this direction is presenting data in a way that's accessible to the visually impaired. It is so important that we try to make data accessible for everyone. And this is this really cool new way to do that, where not only does it utilize a sense that is so unapproached in a lot of what we do, but also it's a great way to bridge the gap for someone who isn't able to engage with data visually. Um, so that's something that I will be talking about later more. And then what I did this summer was combat scientific jargon by presenting data through a universal medium, music. Um, and I think that this makes data approachable to those who aren't experts in the field because a graph might be really wonky, but we have been listening to songs since we were little kids. So I'll take you through my thought process here. Um, so honestly, <laughs> I started doing this research because I said, what if your pet rock could sing to you? Um, and I realized that's not going to get me anywhere, but it was a great start. Um, so then I said, okay, so how do you just make things sing in general? Um, just like, I knew that that was a thing somewhere, um, but I couldn't figure out how. And so that introduced me to the field of sonification. And then when I figured out that you can use sonification to introduce data sets to people who aren't familiar with the field, I started asking, what can I start to learn this field with? What data set is really unapproachable right now? And how can I use this to like push my way into the door of sonification? So that led me to paleoclimatology, which if any of you have taken that class, you know there's some really wonky graphs in there. Um, and it also led me to Nick Palacio, who helped me with my research this summer. So I use insulation, which you can see in these uh, pretty graphs right here. Uh, it's a lot to look at. So it's the energy absorbed by the Earth from the sun, and those changes you see in the little wiggles are influenced by the Earth's movement around the sun. And I'll get more on that later. But the main thing you need to know is that the uh, y-axis are showing measurements of watts per meter squared, or just like that's the energy in that specific area. And these measurements are from six degrees uh, north in June. Why? Nick said that was a good place to take them. Um, I didn't take them though, but he said it was a really great idea. I don't know paleoclimatology very well, but we'll get there. And then every single dot you see is a thousand years. And I just remember looking at it and saying, that looks like sound waves. So that should work fine. So the first step for my research was finding software. Um, I figured there had to be software that I could just put the data into and it would make a sound. And yes, technically there is. Um, the Sonification Sandbox, which is made by the Georgia Institute of Technology, it's actually from their uh, site section, uh, which is really cool, but you can only do discrete point sonification with it. So you could put all these data sets in from the previous slide, um, and you'll hear 1,000 individual little plunks. Um, and that's cool. It's really cool to get to hear it as music, but time is continuous, and I didn't want to do discrete point. I wanted to do continuous. I thought it would fit the data better. And all of these examples you see, sonify, two-tone, et cetera, all have the exact same problem. And they have a more artistic purpose. The things you can do are like make it a violin sound instead of a piano or a marimba, instead of getting to like manipulate the GD1 and like be able to map different parameters to it. So that didn't work either. And then there was some software that made really cool continuous stuff like the, the EKG readings I talked about earlier. But these user interfaces are incredibly field specific. Like it'll say, put your EKG reading in here and then put like the measurements on the machine here. And I can't use that for uh, paleoclimatology. So uh, this was pretty disheartening. This is the first week of my research. And I said, okay, I'm gonna take a little break and come back to this later. This is next week's problem. And so I moved on to the next step, which was learning everything about sonification. So the sonification handbook, it is uh, a 500 plus page textbook 
just about everything in sonification. These are the names of some of the chapters that I thought were particularly interesting. So psychoacoustics, aesthetics, which is a really hot topic because as soon as you start adding aesthetics and art into your scientific research, some more hardcore scientists say that that's not replicable and that it's not exactly hard science, it's more art. So that was a rough chapter to read. And then there's the idea of mapping the acoustic dimensions to data dimensions, like I talked about earlier. And something that I'm going to be working on next is redundancy mapping. So the idea of you have a parameter of data that you really, really want to bring attention to. You can map multiple parameters of the sound, so like amplitude and pitch or something like that, to one specific data parameter. Which it kind of sounds obvious, like of course you can do that. But a lot of things in this textbook sounded really obvious once I read them, but I never would have thought of them on my own. So it's a good read. I highly recommend um, if that's your thing. And then there's a chapter called Laboratory Methods for Experimental Sonification Through Super Collider. And that's when I realized um, I have to know how to code to do this. And I don't know how to code. So that was a rough realization. So then I learned Super Collider. Um, so it's this really cool platform for audio synthesis and algorithmic composition, but you can also supposedly do any type of coding that you would normally do um, in like Python in Super Collider, but they have a bunch of things built in to do music. So the three aspects of Super Collider are the audio server with all the little built in unit generators, which is like a sine wave is an example. Um, the language that comes with it, uh, which is it, it controls the audio server. And then the editor for the language is an integrated help system, which was really cool when I was learning it myself. I could just hit like control D on anything I didn't understand and it would look it up for me. Um, and if you do programming, you'll know that having all of these together in one little area is really cool. If you don't, now you know, you should give it a try. It's pretty fun. Um, but this was really special to figure out. So then I had to realize, uh, I don't know how to code. And I spent five weeks trying to teach myself how to code. Um, I watched YouTube tutorials just for eight hours a day. I read the Super Collider book, which is another super fun textbook, like 800 pages of just everything to do with this really cool programming language that was really daunting. Um, I found as many examples as I could on the internet and I rewrote them line by line and tried to break them down and explain exactly what was happening so I could try to replicate it myself. And after five weeks, I wrote my own piece, and I'm really proud of this, so I'll show it to you. Just brace yourself. Watching, that's what you funded. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> when I made this, um, I said, All right, I'm done for the day. And I emailed this to Nick Velasio, my mother. Uh, I think I emailed it to Rowan. And I said, Look at what I did. And then I went home and took a nap because I was like, I'm peaked for the day. Um, but this is a little intro to what coding looks like. So, I'll use my mouse to point at it so people on Zoom can see. So you declare your variables at the top, and I made each variable a little verse. And then each number you see here in degree corresponds to a number on the piano. So really simple, this is discrete point because each number corresponds to a specific note. So I was so proud of this. I thought there is no way I can ever do anything else again. This is like it for me. So then I decided I'll do it with my data, um, which is, this is the sonification data for um, insulation. And that's a lot more than like numbers zero through eight on the piano. That's 1000 pieces of data, actually. Um, and each of those is in watts per meter squared. And I spent just like two days trying to get this into Super Collider because every single comma and space I had to put in myself. And uh, Brent asked me, so what did you do if you made a mistake? And I said, please don't ask me that. I don't know if I made a mistake. <laughs> so we're just not gonna look at it too closely. <laughs> So here are some of my failed attempts. Um, I wrote this one on the right, which was finally discrete point sonification. And after I wrote this, I realized 
I am exactly where I was on day one with Sonification Sandbox, just six weeks later and much more tired, um, but that's okay. So I named all of my different since yikes and then various numbers. I did get to like 20 something. Um, so yikes 26 is pretty good. You should give it a listen. Um, but the idea of discrete point, I had to put it inside of an envelope, which just like captures the sound. And a percussion envelope is just like a, an attack sound. So an attack of 0 0.01 seconds, sustain for one second, um, and then it releases. And you can see this is the little algorithm I wrote for running the measurements of watts per meter squared into hertz. So it would take everything from my data used to be called A before I changed it to data. Thought that was a little more fitting. I felt so fancy when I did that. Um, but this is a little task and it runs every single number in A through the instrument yikes that I wrote out here, which is just a sine wave. And then the frequency input for A and yikes is running every single data point through F to get hertz. Um, if that doesn't make sense, it's okay. I'm, I had to like remind myself how to do all of that, putting those together. This is what it sounds like. It's not great or particularly interesting and that's okay. Um, so I said, okay, this is not gonna work. I have to, uh, turn this into continuous. And I finally did by loading all of my data into something called a buffer, which is just like a storage space on Super Collider. And I was able to get it to work. There's that little algorithm again. There's my little sine wave again, except that I couldn't make it stop playing. So I would get this really cool sound. And then by the end of it, I would have this. And it would just keep going until I told it to stop. And I could only get it to stop by like command period, which is shut everything down. So that was pretty disheartening for a little bit because um, you can only listen to that sound in headphones for like a week and a half before you go a little crazy. No! <laughs> <laughs> so this is my final product for the end of the summer, my eight weeks of research. So here's my little buffer again, um, loading data into it. And there's my little algorithm again, and a bunch of other stuff that's, it's okay, don't worry about it. Then my little sine wave, um, and I corrected my envelope. So the way I did it, which I couldn't, when you do continuous data, you have to know when to make your envelope stop. And that's in seconds. And I couldn't tell you how many seconds it would take to play 1,000 pieces of data, I could not get that because then every time I changed the rate, I would have to change the seconds again. And it was just going to be this awful going back and forth. So I was like, okay, I actually have to do math. I have to figure this out. So I said, if my duration is in seconds and my rate is in data points per second, if I want to get an answer for duration, just divide the number of data points by the rate. And that should leave me with seconds by itself. And that seems pretty simple, but I could not tell you how proud I was to come up with that. Um, so that's that right there, number of data points divided by rate. So that way, every time I change rate down here, it would end exactly when I wanted it to. And then I changed the amplitude because psychoacoustics, fun fact, whenever we hear a higher frequency, it sounds louder to us than a lower frequency at the exact same decibel. And louder, when you're listening to something, draws your attention to it and makes it more important in your brain. And I didn't want that. I wanted, if I wanted to draw your attention to higher frequencies, I wanted it to be on purpose because I wanted to highlight what was happening in the data at that point. Um, and it was just happening by accident. And that was driving me crazy. So I balanced the amplitude with a little fun thing called AmpConf. I don't know how it works exactly, but it does. And if you multiply the sound by the AmpConf by the envelope, you get my final product. I'm gonna make it a little shorter. Um, but gestalt perception is a whole thing that I didn't feel like telling you about, but it makes it difficult, so.
So what you just heard was, you see that line right there? That was what I showed you earlier. You just heard that whole thing. So it started at now and it went back to a million years ago. And you just listened to the energy that the Earth absorbs from the sun. And I know that's not the most enlightening thing, um, but it was a really good data set to learn how to do all of this with. So the next things I wanna do, I wanna reverse the data. I wanna go forwards in time because I think that by the time your ear finally like understands the pattern is like closer to the end. And that's when I want you to be listening to hear when do humans come into play? When do we start messing things up? And so, uh, sorry, dark view there. Um, I think it would be more important to have the end be now. Um, I don't know exactly how to do that yet, but I'll Google it. And then I want to run it through filters that highlight the important themes, like see down here, solar forcing lines up with stages of glaciation. Solar forcing and insulation are kind of the same thing. Um, ask Nick Velasio more about that, please. Um, so these stages of glaciation, I want to highlight them somehow um, with maybe amplitude or maybe a tick track or something like that. And I want to be able to shorten it a little. So I think I'm going to do some playing with time or something like that to make it slow down now, but speed through the past because it kind of does the same thing for like 50,000, something like that. 500,000. Time is weird in geology. And then I want to turn this, this, and this procession of liquidity and ec eccentricity into songs because when you combine those, how the earth moves, that's what I mentioned earlier that influences the wiggles in solar forcing. And that's pretty hard to like wrap your head around if you don't wanna just trust your professor on that one. So I thought it could be useful to turn each of these into an audio clip, overlap them and highlight some similarities or differences and try to show how the trends in these make the trends in solar forcing. Will it work? I don't know, but I'll find out after I do it. And then the last thing that I would really like to do with this data set is I want to take CO2 levels from ice cores in Antarctica and sonify those and overlap them with the energy that the Earth gets from the sun. And I think my theory is that if you overlap them and highlight where things start to stray from their regular patterns, you should be able to distinguish between cyclical and human-influenced climate change. I don't know, but I'm going to try. So some of the struggles that I had uh, in sonification was that it's a new field and no one has really heard of it. Um, when I was telling Doc Otis about this, he said, oh, did you make this? No, I did not. <laughs> um, I wish I did, that'd be really cool. But it's just that it's only been around for like 10, 15 years. And in science time, that's a very short amount of time. Um, another problem with it, not problem, it's my favorite part of it, but it makes things a little difficult is that it blurs the line between science and the arts. And once you start adding aesthetics into your science, things seem subjective. And they could be, it definitely could be subjective, um, but it makes it hard to make it replicable, which is really important in science. Another thing that I found is that scientists who do work in sonification will not publish their audio, their data set, and their code all together. And I understand intellectual property, but it makes it so hard to replicate their work and figure it out yourself. Um, so, Scientists, if you're watching, please publish your code. I would like that a lot, thank you. Um, and then also, once you have your data set and you're realizing you need to do things to manipulate it and make it like highlight important trends, you have to know what trends are actually important, which means you have to actually understand the data set. And I don't really know paleoclimatology that well. So I need to be an expert or at least pretty well versed in whatever field I start doing in-depth research in, which is a little difficult. So going forward, these are the things that I would like to do. And I just think everyone in the field should be looking towards. The first one is, in my opinion, the most important. I think that audio components need to be added to museum exhibits to make them more accessible to the visually impaired. I think this would take using model-based sonification um, to make them more interactive. That's the type of thing that needs to be able to read an image out in sound. Um, but museums are lovely and interactive and they engage children and adults alike. And the idea that there's a barrier because it's so, it's such a visual experience is heartbreaking. And I think that we need to be able to add some audio to it and utilize that amazing sense that we have and include more people in it. I think that we should continue sonifying complex data sets to enhance comprehension, whether in the college room or in like the elementary school classroom, 
because STEAM is STEM within the arts is incredibly important and we can be auditory learners as much as we are visual learners. And then the last one is kind of what I would like to do with my installation data set when it comes to highlighting climate change is engage with politically charged fields through sonification to reconfigure data in ways that are more approachable for the general public. Because you can show people graphs that tell you exactly, we know this thing, especially right now. You can show someone data, but if you are not an expert in the field, it's very difficult to understand and trust the, the conclusions that the people who made the data are drawing for you. And I think that transforming that data into a way that's more consumable to the general public would make things a lot easier to, to get across. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Questions for Heather or come for Heather? Thank, Thank you. you. Question. Yes, Virginia. So I know you've done a lot of this work in paleoclimatology. Have you thought about other fields that you want to expand your research into? Absolutely. I'll repeat it for Zoom. Um, so she, Virginia asked, I've done my research with paleoclimatology. Are there other fields that I want to expand that into? Absolutely. Um, I think it would be really cool. You can use the different dimensions of data to set the stage with the music and make it more volcanology, for example. If I were to apply sonification to volcanology and play with like the timber and pitch and everything and make it like you're inside of a volcano, basically make it like an immersive experience. I think that'd be really cool. But also when I was first working on my pitch for this whole project, I was looking at fossil diversity data um, on the East Coast. And I think it would be really cool to do some sort of model based sonification that went down or up the East Coast in one way or another or through time um, and show evolution through a song, maybe, if that's not too optimistic. Any other questions? Yes, Neil? Oh, great job. This is really cool. Oh, I thanks. Uh, seeing you struggling a little bit over the summer, so it's awesome to see you. You watched me cry. I was just saying, though. I was really interested when you mentioned that that book card kind of mentioned that, like, aesthetics were not, like, getting in the way, but kind of confusing the science. I was wondering if like based off this experience, do you see other ways that geologists can benefit from kind of taking a more artistic approach, or do you see it also the way that the way? I I love that question. Thank you. Um, trying to restate it. Um, talking about how aesthetics can get in the way and the way that geologists can integrate aesthetics or um maybe shouldn't or something like that. Um, I think that we need to start approaching aesthetics with the mindset of there's a reason why the scientist included it. And if they put that information forward, and there's a reason why, it's like when you see the pieces of art in museums that someone made showing what a crinoid looked like back in the day. Um, like it's, it's artistic liberties that they're taking, but they're using science behind it to back up their point. And I think that if we embrace the artistic aspect of science a little more, we can probably progress a lot faster because we're not like fighting each other as much. If that makes sense. Another question? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. That's fine. Um, you did a really good presentation. I'm Ryan, by the way. Hi. Um, the I, question I did have is how do you establish um, a baseline? So with a graph, zero is always zero, 400 is always 400, but there's only a certain range that we can hear. So do you have to constantly move that baseline and establish that before you actually play your your music? Uh, or how does that work and how, how have previous people tried to approach that problem? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the question was about establishing the baseline because with graphs, we can see like zero to whatever, but with our ears, we can only like pick up a certain thing. So that was an entire chapter of the sonification handbook, good read again. Um, and it talks about what we can perceive when it comes to each dimension. So we are limited by what we can hear, but luckily, what we can hear is an incredible amount. So there's a range that we can hear in Hertz. I believe it's like 400 to 4,000 or something like that because Hertz are um, exponential. 
And you can play in that as much as you want, or like with decibels, there's only so much we can hear before it could potentially damage our ears or something like that. Or we have to take into account someone who is listening to it might not have the exact same range of hearing that someone else might have. Um, and it's really difficult. That's something that I found really glossed over a lot in a lot of the work I've seen. They didn't really explain why they chose the parameters that they chose. I personally chose 300 to, uh, to 1000 Hertz because it felt comfortable knowing that it was going to jump up and down a lot in that data set. And I didn't want it to be like grinding to the ears. But again, that is subjective. What is a grinding pitch for me might be completely fine to someone else. So I think it's definitely a way to combat that is crowdsourcing. Um, they explain in the book when you're doing your experimental sonification, every step of the way you need to show it to like a bunch of people and get a general consensus on, is this painful to listen to? Is my range that I set too small um, or too big? Um, especially knowing that like the watts that varied in my set were only like 100 or like 50 apart. So it was a much smaller range than like the, the many hundred that I was using for the Hertz. And so you also have to take into account the amount of change that's happening in the sound that you chose might seem like it might make a small change seem really significant because you chose too big a range. So crowdsourcing is probably my best bet with that because there's no set what everyone can or cannot hear. So taking like a really big sample size. Yes, Rowan? Um, so uh, one quick comment and one quick question. Uh, first of all, you did a beautiful job with that. That was really, really wonderful. Um, Thank you. Great to hear about your research. So the quick comment is that I, I kind of feel like science, no matter what we try to tell ourselves, science is still subjective. There's yeah. subjectivity in almost everything we do on a daily basis in science. We would say that science is somehow separate from subjectivity. I think it's really naive mm -hmm. finding folks that are, that are criticizing aesthetics. So for what it's worth, um, you know, you're on one gradient of subjectivity, but science is full of subjectivity. And then the second uh, question, have you have you tried reaching out to the authors who aren't publishing their data and code and ask if they'd be willing to share their code? Because a lot of times scientists are, I, I wondered if maybe in this field they might be willing to share. Yes, absolutely. So I reached out to the um, political artist, um, Andrea Pulley, and she sent me her like 700 page dissertation um, there's no code in that entire thing, but it does explain everything behind it. Um, I reached out to the person who did the EKG readings, but unfortunately they passed away. Um, you can find a lot of, there's some like hubs online where people will post like, I sonify and sleigh bells, um, and you can see that, but it's difficult because there's just not that many people doing it. Um, when you write them explicitly ask that they can share their code, they, mm -hmm. there's not much. Yeah, um, and also not everyone uses super collider. Of course. Um, I wish everyone did. It's super cool. Uh, oh, that was like a little fun there. Sorry. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? Are there any in Zoom? Can you stop sharing? I think there might be some. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I totally yeah. Oh, no. Oh, hi, Nick. Okay. <laughs> Nick said, one question through his time, human impacts on climate are relatively recent, especially compared to the last 1 million years. Is there a way to scale your sonification so the period of human impact is not just a millisecond of sound? Generally, how will you deal with that influence of time scales? That is exactly what I've been working on, Nick. Thank you. Um, so that is a problem. The amount of time, okay, geology and in general time, pretty big. And humans, as much as we think we are the most important thing on this earth, we've only been here for like this really tiny amount of time. And that's really difficult when he's exactly right. It would be this tiny little blip in that entire piece I showed you. Um, I've been looking on scales. I've been trying to think, is there an algorithmic way to not make the beginning of time so fast that it you can't perceive any of the changes in the data, any of the trends or anything, because it's happening so fast, while also being able to like stretch the time at the end. Um, I've been thinking some sort of, I don't remember math, like a logarithmic, or is that, thank you. Um, 
I'm wondering if there's a way that I can do the rate in instead of just a set number of like 50 data sets per second, um, putting in some sort of equation that would stretch the time. The only thing that I haven't figured out about that is when you use time, um, when you use like spacing is one of the dimensions of sound. When you start modifying spacing and not making it steady with the fact that time is steady, you start highlighting trends that you stretch out something that in reality was so tiny that it seems like there's a really important trend that you're supposed to pick up, but it actually isn't. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Nick? I think, uh, yeah. I, I have one, actually, I have a kind of a comment or a thought as you were giving this wonderful presentation, which has really put me in a really positive, happy place. And I, Thanks. I Growing metastasis is really important for science and it's just a big change that's happening now. And I was thinking about things, you know, how I how I talk to people and about like climate change and how it's really hard people who don't understand the science but who are non-believers. And then I was thinking about just to get political here, vaccination rates. Absolutely. And thinking about, wow, if we could show vaccination rates as in, in positive, pleasant sound, you know, as a positive, as more vaccinations are happening, that and to show this graph in this way, that not only does it become a pleasing or pleasant sound when <laughs> vaccination rates are greater, and it's and it's not a good sound when it's when it's um, vaccination rates are lower. Just thinking about other uses for it uh, in the future, that that sound, those pleasant sounds, uh, uh, would relate to positive for me. Absolutely. I don't know if you have a comment about that, but that was what I was thinking while, while you were. I do actually have a comment on that. Yeah. Um, so something that I um, a specific set of code that I rewrote a couple times to like really understand what was happening in it was someone who sonified the use of the death penalty in certain states. And it was really poignant um, with the percussive sound that they used. It really resembled a gunshot and it was really hard to listen to, but it was really amazing that they did that because it got to a point where it was just the most rapid sound and it was heartbreaking to hear. And I think that the use of aesthetics when it comes to really important political topics right now is it's essential and I want to work on it. I've actually really thought about doing something when it comes to like vaccination or COVID. And I'll be honest, the reason that I haven't been going in that direction yet is because I'm a little scared. I don't feel like I know enough in the fields being completely like self-taught to make something that would have the right impact that I want it to have instead of when you're using something where what you're putting out there can directly influence someone's choices. I don't want to do that wrong in this particular moment. So that's something that I've really been thinking about a lot. Um, I think it's so important. You do it with extinction. I absolutely can do it with extinction. It's, a, it's another toughie right there. <laughs> Any more questions? Let's thank Heather one more time. Thank you.